First part of chapter four of the first volume of the Life of Reason. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Fredrik Karlsson. The Life of Reason by George Santayana. Chapter four on some critics of this discovery. Side note psychology as a solvent the english psychologists who first disintegrated the idea of substance and whose traces we have in general followed in the above account did not study the question wholly for its own sake or in the spirit of a science that aims at nothing but a historical analysis of mind they had a more or less malicious purpose behind their psychology they thought that if they could once show how metaphysical ideas are made they would discredit those ideas and banish them for ever from the world if they retained confidence in any notion as hobbes in body locke in matter and in god berkeley in spirits and kant the inheritor of this malicious psychology in the thing in itself and in heaven it was merely by inadvertence or want of courage the principle of their reasoning where they chose to apply it was always this that ideas whose materials could all be accounted for in consciousness and referred to sense or to the operations of mind were thereby exhausted and deprived of further validity only the unaccountable or rather the uncriticized could be true consequently the advance of psychology meant in this school the retreat of reason for as one notion after another was clarified and reduced to its elements it was ipso facto deprived of its function so far were these philosophers from conceiving that validity and truth are ideal relations accruing to ideas by virtue of dialectic and use that while on the one hand they pointed out vital affinities and pragmatic sanctions in the mind's economy they confessed on the other that the outcome of their philosophy was sceptical for no idea could be found in the mind which was not a phenomenon there and no inference could be drawn from these phenomena not based on some inherent tendency to feign the analysis which was in truth legitimizing and purifying knowledge seemed to them absolutely to blast it and the closer they came to the bedrock of experience the more incapable they felt of building up anything upon it self-knowledge meant they fancied self-detection the representative value of thought decreased as thought grew in scope and elaboration it became impossible to be at once quite serious and quite intelligent for to use reason was to indulge in subjective fiction while conscientiously to abstain from using it was to sink back upon inarticulate and brutish instinct in hume this sophistication was frankly avowed philosophy discredited itself but a man of parts who loved intellectual games even better than backgammon might take a hand with the wits and historians of his day until the clock struck twelve and the party was over even in kant though the mood was more cramped and earnest the mystical sophistication was quite the same kant too imagined that the bottom had been knocked out of the world that in comparison with some unutterable sort of truth empirical truth was falsehood and that validity for all possible experience was weak validity in comparison with validity of some other an unmentionable sort since space and time could not repel the accusation of being the necessary forms of perception space and time were not to be much thought of and when the sad truth was disclosed that causality and the categories were instrument by which the idea of nature had to be constructed if such an idea was to exist at all 
then nature and cordiality shriveled up and were dishonored together so that the soul's occupation being gone she must needs appeal to some mysterious oracle some abstract and irrelevant omen within the breast and muster up all the stern courage of an accepted despair to carry her through this world of mathematical illusion into some green and infantile paradise beyond sidenote misconceived role of intelligence what idea we may well ask ourselves did these modern philosophers entertain regarding the pretensions of ancient and medieval metaphysics what understanding had they of the spirit in which the natural organs of reason had been exercised and developed in those schools frankly very little for they accepted from ancient philosophy and from common sense the distinction between reality and appearance but they forgot the function of that distinction and dislocated its meaning which was nothing but to translate the chaos of perception into the regular play of stable natures and objects congenial to discursive thought and valid in the art of living philosophy had been the natural science of perception raised to the reflective plane the objects maintaining themselves on this higher plane being styled realities and those still floundering below it being called appearances or mere ideas the function of envisaging reality ever since parmenides and heraclitus had been universally attributed to the intellect when the moderns therefore proved anew that it was the mind that framed that idea and that what we call reality substance nature or god can be reached only by an operation of reason they made no very novel or damaging discovery of course it is possible to disregard the suggestions of reason in any particular case and it is quite possible to believe for instance that the hypothesis of an external material world is an erroneous one but that this hypothesis is erroneous does not follow from the fact that it is a hypothesis to discard it on that ground would be to discard all recent knowledge and to deny altogether the validity of thought if intelligence is assumed to be an organ of cognition and a vehicle for truth a given hypothesis about the causes of perception can only be discarded when a better hypothesis on the same subject has been supplied to be better such a hypothesis would have to meet the multiplicity of phenomena and their mutations with a more intelligible scheme of comprehension and a more useful instrument of control sidenote all criticism dogmatic skepticism is always possible while it is partial it will remain the privilege and resource of a free mind that has elasticity enough to disintegrate its own formations and to approach its experience from a variety of sides and with more than a single method but the method chosen must be coherent in itself and the point of view assumed must be adhered to during that survey so that whatever reconstruction the novel view may produce in science will be science still and will involve assumptions and dogmas which must challenge comparison with the dogmas and assumptions they would supplant people speak of dogmatism as if it were a method to be altogether outgrown and something for which some non-assertive philosophy could furnish a substitute but dogmatism is merely a matter of degree some thinkers and some systems retreat further than others 
into the stratum beneath current conventions and make us more conscious of the complex machinery which working silently in the soul makes possible all the rapid and facile operations of reason the deeper this retrospective glance the less dogmatic the philosophy a primordial constitution or tendency however must always remain having structure and involving a definite life for if we thought to reach some wholly vacant and indeterminate point of origin we should have reached something wholly impotent and indifferent a blank pregnant with nothing that we wish to explain or that actual experience presented when starting with the inevitable preformation and constitutional bias we sought to build up a simpler and nobler edifice of thought to be a palace and fortress rather than a prison for experience our critical philosophy would still be dogmatic since it would be built upon inexplicable but actual data by a process of inference underived but inevitable side note a choice of hypotheses no doubt aristotle and the scholastics were often uncritical they were too intent on building up and buttressing their system on the broad human or religious foundations which they had chosen for it they nursed the comfortable conviction that whatever their thought contained was eternal and objective truth a copy of the divine intellect or of the world's intelligible structure a sceptic may easily deride that confidence of theirs their system may have been their system and nothing more but the way to proceed if we wish to turn our shrewd suspicions and our sense of insecurity into an articulate conviction and to prove that they erred is to build another system a more modest one perhaps which will grow more spontaneously and inevitably in the mind out of the data of experience obviously the rival and critical theory will make the same tacit claim as the other to absolute validity if all our ideas and perceptions conspire to reinforce the new hypothesis this will become inevitable and necessary to us we shall then condemn the other hypothesis not indeed for having been a hypothesis which is the common fate of all rational and interpretative thought but for having been a hypothesis artificial misleading and false one not following necessarily nor intelligibly out of the facts nor leading to a satisfactory reaction upon them either in contemplation or in practice side note critics disguised enthusiasts now this is in truth exactly the conviction which those malicious psychologists secretly harbored their critical scruples and transcendental qualms covered a robust rebellion against being fooled by authority they rose to abate abuses among which as hobbes said the frequency of insignificant speech is one their psychology was not merely a cathartic but a gospel their young criticism was sent into the world to make straight the path of a new positivism as now in its old age it is invoked to keep open the door of superstition some of those reformers like hobbes and locke had at heart the interests of a physical and political mechanism which they wished to substitute for the cumbrous and irritating constraints of tradition their criticism stopped at the frontiers of their practical discontent they did not care to ask how the belief in matter space motion god or whatever else still retained their allegiance could withstand the kind of psychology which as they conceived had done away with individual essences and nominal powers 
berkeley whose interest lay in a different quarter used the same critical method in support of a different dogmatism armed with the traditional pietistic theory of providence he undertook with a light heart to demolish the whole edifice which reason and science had built upon spatial perception he wished the lay intellect to revert to a pious idiocy in the presence of nature lest consideration of her history and laws should breed mathematical atheists and the outer world being thus reduced to a sensuous dream and to the blur of immediate feeling intelligence and practical faith would be more unremittingly employed upon christian mythology men would be bound to it by unnecessary allegiance there being no longer any rival object left for serious or intelligent consideration the psychological analysis on which these partial or total negations were founded was in a general way admirable the necessary artifices to which it had recourse in distinguishing simple and complex ideas principles of associations and inference were nothing but premonitions of what a physiological psychology would do in referring the mental process to its organic and external supports for experience has no other divisions than those it creates in itself by distinguishing its objects and its organs reference to external conditions though seldom explicit in these writers who imagined they could appeal to an introspection not revealing the external world was pervasive in them as for instance where you made his fundamental distinction between impressions and ideas where their discrimination was based nominally on relative vividness and priority in time but really on causation respectively by outer objects or by spontaneous processes in the brain sidenote hume's gratuitous skepticism hume it was who carried this psychological analysis to its goal giving it greater simplicity and universal scope and he had also the further advantage of not nursing any metaphysical challenging of his own to substitute for the legitimate offspring of human understanding his curiosity was purer and his scepticism more impartial so that he laid bare the natural habits and necessary fictions of thought with singular lucidity and sufficient accuracy for general purposes but the malice of a psychology intended as a weapon against superstition here recoils on science itself hume like berkeley was extremely young scarce five-and-twenty when he wrote his most incisive work he was not ready to propose in theory that test of ideas by their utility which in practice he and the whole english school have instinctively adopted an ulterior test of validity would not have seemed to him satisfactory for though inclined to rebellion and positivism he was still the pupil of that mythical philosophy which attributed the value of things to their origin rather than to their uses because it had first in its parabolic way erected the highest good into a first cause still breathing in spite of himself this atmosphere of materialized platonism hume could not discover the true origin of anything without imagining that he had destroyed its value a natural child meant for him an illegitimate one his philosophy had not yet reached the wisdom of that french lady who asked if all children were not natural the outcome of his psychology and criticism seemed accordingly to be an inhibition of reason he was left free to choose between the distractions of backgammon and sitting down in a forlorn scepticism 
in his first youth while disintegrating reflection still overpowered the active interests of his mind hume seems to have had some moments of genuine suspense and doubt but with years and prosperity the normal habits of inference which he had so acutely analyzed asserted themselves in his own person and he yielded to the tendency to feign so far at least as to believe languidly in the histories who wrote the compliments he received and the succulent dinners he devoured there is a kind of courtesy in scepticism it would be an offence against polite convention to press our doubts too far and question the permanence of our estates our neighbours independent existence or even the justification of a good bishop's faith and income against metaphysicians and even against bishops sarcasm was not without its savour but the line must be drawn somewhere by a gentleman and a man of the world hume found no obstacle in his speculation to the adoption of all necessary and useful conceptions in the sphere to which he limited his mature interests that he never extended this liberty to believe into more speculative and comprehensive regions was due simply to a voluntary superficiality in his thought had he been interested in the rationality of things he would have laboured to discover it as he laboured to discover that historical truth or that political utility to which his interests happened to attach End of chapter four part one